Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me today. Now today I have a very, very special guest that I'm very proud to host on my channel. His name is Art Benjamin. You might know him from some TED Talks. He currently goes by the Math Magician. Uh, he's a professor of maths at Harvey Mudd College. He was recently inducted in the USBGF Bagowan Hall of Fame. He has a best-selling maths book there's, there's many other books to his name and other accolades we can talk about later. Um, welcome, Art. Thank you for joining me today. Great to be here, Dan. So um, I recently saw two of your uh, talks live at the UK Open, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, the first talk was, was very fun, where you were just doing some kind of number magic. And the second one was a bit more technical, and looking at positions over the board. So how did you first know you were good at maths? Did you have like a, a moment of a, an enlightenment when you were young or what happened? You know, yeah, I, I don't think that one day I woke up, I saw my alarm clock, I heard the number and saw my gosh, what happened there? But no, it was, uh, uh, I, I've always enjoyed numbers. I've always enjoyed maths. Um, uh, for as long as I can remember, for as long as my parents could remember, um, I, I've, in, I've numbers and games and magic, I think have been a part of my life for, uh, since I was a little kid. So, um, so yeah. does he really, I, I, haven't, I haven't changed all that much. <laughs> keep a, keep being a child alive. Yeah. Do you, do you, um, does he run in a family? Were your parents, your grandparents, particularly good mathematicians? Um, my mother was a sort of math phobic. She, um, mm. she was, uh, I, I would sometimes help her with some of her, her classes. Um, <laughs> my dad was an accountant, uh, by day and an actor and director by night. Um, his mother was also an accountant. So maybe the, maybe the numbers part of the, genes came through that line maybe uh, and, and your children are they growing up to be uh budding mathematicians or yeah well they, they're, they're I have two daughters and they've both taken a lot of mathematics in high school and college my older daughter um uh who was a psychology and spanish major but she minored in statistics so she got she had a lot of mathematics at her university and my younger daughter is taking calculus right now but I don't think she plans on uh, pursuing math. But the, what was important to me was that neither of them was afraid of math, you know. And I and just like my parents did for me, they they allowed me to find my passion, and that's what I want my children and my students and my friends is for them to find their passion in life. And the, the more passions you have, I think the more fun and exciting life can be. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I am an English teacher, so I, I've done some teaching myself. And uh, what's interesting is um, when I walk around town, I see English everywhere. I see metaphors and alliteration. Is is that the same for you in maths? You just see maths kind of everywhere you go. You know, I guess it is. It's a it's a way of viewing the world through a uh, through a mathematical lens. And um yeah, once you once you think that way, um, it, it's it's everywhere. Yeah, so a lot of students, you know, that that I teach also take take maths, and some of them have to hey, redo maths. Uh, they failed the first time around at school for for various reasons, um, and they have this very like sour view towards maths. That you know, I can just use a calculator. Why do I need to know all this stuff? But, how do you mm -hmm. how do you encourage like youngsters to to engage with maths nowadays? Or what do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, and I think I think students have every right to ask the question: um, When am I going to need this? Why Why am I learning this? Um, and it's if it was only about learning how to do arithmetic that your the calculator on your phone can do then they have every, every right to say, what, what's the point? Um, but it's not about, um, it's not about multiplying numbers. It's, it was never about that. It was using math and algebra 
and higher mathematics to understand the world, especially uh, the world that we live in that is just so filled with data and information. I mean, we take calculated risks every day of our lives and um, consciously or subconsciously, we need to be calculating those risks to decide if it's worth it. Is it worth um, driving an hour to get the thing we want to get or or paying that entry fee to enter that backgammon tournament? Um, <laughs> you know, those are, and certainly over the backgammon board, we're, we're weighing uh, decisions uh, every, every time we roll the dice. So, um, uh, so I, I think it's important that when mathematics is taught, that students are exposed both to the beautiful side of the subject as well as the numerous applications of the subject. I think if they don't see either of those, um, we're doing them a disservice. Yeah, absolutely. Surely something as simple as going grocery shopping requires a, a level of maths, <laughs> you, you could say. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of math we do in our lives where you don't or we don't want to pull out a calculator. Let's say you're negotiating uh, buying a car or you're or you're reading the newspaper and you're saying, oh, my gosh, what is this new economic policy going to cost us as average citizens? You know, you might say, oh, you know, I can get a good mental estimate of what this is going to cost or what it's going to be worth for us. Um, so, yeah, in fact, I, I wish they would spend more time in school putting an emphasis on mental mathematics as opposed to the laborious pencil and paper mathematics. You'll mm -hmm. never in your life need to multiply two three-digit numbers on paper in your life. <laughs> you know, there, if, if you ever really needed to, to see the product of two big numbers, you would pull out a calculator and do that. On the other hand, you would be at a severe disadvantage in life if you didn't know your multiplication tables through 10. Sure. If you didn't know how to do a mental approximation when you're adding or subtracting three digit, four digit numbers um, to get a sense of what the product or quotient of those numbers should be. That's, a, that's an important life skill. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe we should spend a little more time on mental math and a little less time on math for math's sake. Yeah, and I mean, and how do, you de how do you define mental math? Like, what do you actually mean by mental math? H how is that different? Meaning, um, well, meaning um, it, maybe it's not so important to get the exact answer mm -hmm. as to get a good approximation of the answer. Right. Um, uh, when, when I do my mental math, for example, I do it all from left to right. You know, so I'll calculate the millions and then the thousands and then the hundreds and then the tens and ones where um, on paper, we're taught to do it backwards, the ones and the tens and the hundreds and the thousands and the millions. <laughs> and by the time you get to the millions, you may have made some mistakes. And yet the most important part of the answer is the millions, not the ones. Yeah. So, um, you know, what are what are those skills that would allow us to get a pretty good estimate of the actual answer quickly. Yeah. Um, no, as kind of, kind of like we do in backgammon. Yeah. You know? Well, we'll come into backgammon later, but as we run the topic, I must segue into some mental math that you do, which I've seen live. Um, so let me give you some numbers to to multiply. Right. Do, you have a, uh, Dan, do you have a calculator with you? Do you have one uh, on your phone or something? Okay, so I, I do have a calculator here. I'm not sure how okay. it will show That's up. Awesome. Well, the audience All right, to... so here, <laughs> let's do let, it. Let, 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 let me let me direct you to do to, to do a, a, some problems then. Okay. Uh, so be, give us a two-digit number, just a two-digit number to say. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight, and another two-digit number. Um, fifty-five. Multiply twenty-eight times fifty-five. Make sure you get one thousand five hundred forty. Go ahead, do it. Yep, straight away. Uh, yeah, and I can't see it, but it's it's correct. <laughs> well, I can see it on your screen. All right, now my specialty is squaring numbers, taking numbers times themselves. And maybe your calculator has a shortcut for squaring. If it does, go ahead and use it. Um, like five squared is 25, six squared is 36. Um, give us a two digit number as a first problem. So. Um, let's do 87. 
87 squared is 7,569. Correct. Right? Let's, nice. let's do, let's, let's raise the stakes because I've done two <laughs> digit numbers for such a long time that I'm afraid a lot of those answers I just know, but when it's, but, but for three digit numbers and higher, I honestly am calculating every digit in my head, give us a three digit number and I will try and square it as quickly as you can do on the calculator. Let's do 321. That's 103,041. 103041. Wow. And that was faster than I actually typed it onto the screen. There we go. <laughs> Amazing. So Remarkable. that's, um, I mean, we'll do one more three digit number. That one was kind of an easy one. Okay. Let's do 962. That would be 925,444. <laughs> yes. Terrific. <laughs> okay. Um, that, and and, and I, ha I have a book that outlines all of the techniques for doing maths in your head. Um, it's, you can get it on Amazon or any place that fine books are sold. It's called Secrets of Mental Maths. Um, might, might, in the UK, it might be called um, Look Like a Maths Genius or something. But same, it's uh, Secrets of Mental Math is, is the book. Yeah, I remember you saying something at the talk that in was in multiplying by eleven, you add a one between. Am, am I getting that right? You add a one I, between the two numbers. To, to multiply two numbers, uh, let's say a two-digit number by eleven, mm -hmm. say forty-two times eleven, you add four plus two, which is six, and the six goes in the middle. So it, the answer would be four six two. 53 times 11, since 5 plus 3 is 8, would be 5, 8, 3. And if the numbers add up to 10 or higher, like let's say it was 85 times 11, 8 plus 5 is 13, um, the 1 makes the 8 carry, mm -hmm. the 3 goes in the middle, and the answer would be 9, 3, 5. So 85 times 11, since 8 plus 5 is 13 is nine three five by the way why not teach that in school right that's <laughs> mention it's been around for centuries but it's fun it's empowering it makes people say oh man this because this is kind of cool yeah and and i remember off. a school like when multiples of nine added up to nine and that was like something i've never forgotten <laughs> it's magical, absolutely and i don't think enough people get exposed to the magical side of mathematics and that's that's been my my professional life's mission. Yeah, amazing mission to have. And so your book, Secrets of Mental Math, has a lot of these kind of shortcuts or, or tricks um, into mm -hmm. maths, how to get better really fast. They kind of act like mnemonics, don't they, in some way? Do there, there's to... also, it also includes how to memorize numbers, um, uh, whether it be your credit card number, passport number, match equity tables, you know, anything where you have numbers that you want to memorize. Um, there's a, what I use is something called a phonetic code that allows numbers to be turned into words in a very efficient way. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and, and that is literally how I've memorized the match equities within a nine point match, the take points within mm -hmm. a nine point match, the, um, uh, various other things. I think that's really useful because a lot of players are somewhat kind of daunted by the match equity table. How am I going to remember all these percentages um, <laughs> when actually having some sort of mnemonic or some sort of, you know, shortcut is, is very beneficial. Um, and, and the nice thing about using the mnemonics is it doesn't involve any numerical calculation. So you're going to be using those numbers and presumably doing some arithmetic with those numbers. Um, or at least you're just going to say, oh, is this number above 22% or below 22% in terms of is this, how does this compare to a money take? And, um, uh, and so you don't want to be doing arithmetic to arrive at those numbers. You just want to be able to get them directly. Mm -hmm. And that's what, um, uh, that's what these methods allow you to do. And, and like, how well does that work? Well, like once you've remembered it, is that, is it just like locked in? then you, ne you never forget it or? Well, and you, you rehearse it occasionally, um, maybe before a tournament, you, you look at your, your table, your mnemonics and say, oh yeah, that, that's right. I remember this number. I remember that number, um, you know, <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, after a while, I have an article on how to memorize any match equity table in the US BGF magazine. So those those people who get the magazine can read all about it. And, read all uh, about it. That sounds, sounds, sounds a great article. So you are a professor at Harvey Mudd College. That's correct, isn't it? That's correct. Um, and you've been there for a number of years. I, I, 30, 33 years, I believe. Wow. Maybe I'm yeah, yeah, going on 34. And, and obviously you love working there and you love working with the students and I imagine you're a fantastic teacher. What do you, what do, you do there exactly with, with the classes? Like what, talk us through like your, your day job <laughs> as it were. So. Um, I, well, I love, uh, you know, I, I, when I was a kid, I think what I really wanted to be when I grew up was a magician. I wanted to be an entertainer. I wanted to be in front of groups. I wanted people to laugh at my jokes and applaud when I finished. And, um, and I found that teaching, except for the applause part, um, really does satisfy uh, those criteria. I'm, I'm there sharing what I think is just beautiful material, mathematical material with an audience. And I don't expect them to be in love with the subject when the class begins, but I hope by the, the time, by the, by the time the semester ends, I hope that my students at the very least are less afraid of the subject. And ideally most of them really like the subject <laughs> and I want to learn more about it. So that's my, that's my, my goal. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, as a job, it's I, very little of what I do is considered work for me because teaching is fun. Mm -hmm. Meeting students in my office is fun. Writing oh. papers and solving problems is fun. Yeah. For the last four <laughs> years, my research has focused on backgammon and that that's extra fun because, you know, I would do this for free. <laughs> when I retire in a few years, I expect I will still be doing research on backgammon and, you know, just for the fun of it. Fabulous. So. I, I love your enthusiasm and I empathize very much so as being a teacher myself. I, I you know, I, I face the same uh, challenges uh, in the classroom and Yep. If I can get some some joy out of the subject, then it's a success. It's it's a win, isn't it? Um, absolutely, absolutely. You, you so you you focus um, on combinatorics. Um, I've read now. Can you explain what what that is to the layman? What what is combinatorics? Combinatorics is the mathematics of counting things. So, for example, how many ways can you put six? 15 identical checkers in your home board in backgammon. So you've got six points to allocate these 15 checkers. Um, how many ways can that be done? Suppose it was 15 checkers or less. Yeah. How many ways can that be done? Mm. You know, how many ways where no, no point has more than five checkers on it? You know, how many ways can that be done? Those are questions in combinatorics because you're, you're thinking of how many ways can things be combined? Mm -hmm. And there's just some beautiful, beautiful mathematics um, involved in that. Uh, I also enjoy probability, statistics, game theory, um, number theory. Uh, it's all, <laughs> all pure fun to me. How does something like combinatorics uh, apply to the real world? You know, how, how, why is it important? Well, um, first of all, it doesn't have to be applied in order to be important. And to, to mm -hmm. me, as, you know, and, and you would know, you would appreciate as an English teacher, somebody might say, well, why is Shakespeare? <laughs> and you could say, well, maybe you could live your life without ever seeing or appreciating Shakespeare, but it would be a less fulfilling life. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I feel the same is true about mathematics. Mathematics is actually a form of poetry. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's the poetry of, of ideas. It's the poetry of logic. When one writes a mathematics paper, there's an actual logical flow that, that is as structured as any sonnet. And mm -hmm. um, uh, but nevertheless, the it, the combinatorics does have applications in the real world, whether it be things like um, 
uh, when lotteries are created, um, uh, the, they use combinatorics to design those lotteries. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when internet cryptography is used to make your uh, financial transactions secure, combinatorics and number theory are lurking underneath. Um, I wrote a paper just a few years ago about something that I'll say it's applied. You can tell me if it's important or not. Um, suppose you do they do you play the game bingo? Is that a game that's played? Sure, I played it. Yeah, bingo, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you've got a, a five by five card with, and there's seventy five bingo balls, and yeah, sure. Um, if you get five in a row or five in a column, uh, that gives you 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 win. Yeah, right. So let's suppose and now if you're just playing a game by yourself, is it more likely that you get five horizontally or five vertically? All right. Now, you may suspect it's 50 50 the same either way, and you would be correct. All right. It is equally likely to get five horizontal or five vertical. But now suppose you and I walk by a big bingo parlor and there are hundreds of people playing. And we hear somebody excitedly say, bingo, I've got it, okay? And I say to you, Dan, look, it's 50-50. I'll bet that person had a horizontal win. What do you think? Let's, let's bet on that. If it's horizontal, I win. If it's vertical, you win, all right? Turns out I'm a two-to-one favorite to be that, 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 uh, that the winning bingo card with lots of cards out there is more likely to be a horizontal win than a vertical win. And the more cards are out there, if there were thousands and thousands, millions of cards out there, it would actually be a three to one uh, advantage of horizontal versus vertical. And that's very unintuitive. Mm, very much but using so. <laughs> combinatorics, uh, we figured that out. So that's that's one of my more fun mathematical results that, um, is it important? I don't know. Is it beautiful? I think so. Yeah, I, I agree. And I like the idea of beauty. Like I call my channel Bad Gammon is Beautiful. Absolutely. Because because there's, there's beauty in patterns and shapes and and, and that's very mathematical. Geometry, it, it, it can be beautiful. What what do you find Absolutely. beautiful, Art, about maths? Well, what, say do, it again. what do you find beautiful about maths? You know, um, Again, it is this poetry of ideas, but within within the universe of mathematics, my favorite numbers are the Fibonacci numbers. These are numbers that are as easy to understand as one plus one equals two. So it starts off with one and one, then we add them together to get two, then we add one and two together to get three, Mm -hmm. then we add two and three together to get five, then three plus five is eight, 13, 21, 34, they go on forever. You could spend your life discovering and rediscovering <laughs> beautiful patterns that live inside of these numbers. And I could talk for hours just about the Fibonacci <laughs> numbers. And let's not do that. But um, uh, I, I guess and I, I guess I would say within mathematics, I combine combinatorics with Fibonacci numbers to discover some pretty cool things, at least in my opinion. Um, you are the professor of a Fibonacci society. That's there, a- is a, there, there is a, there's actually a professional society called the Fibonacci Association. <laughs> and I am currently serving a five-year term as its president. So yes, I'm, I'm very invested in uh, the Fibonacci uh, numbers. You, you've, you've intrigued me, Art. Can you give us a little taster of something about the Fibonacci, which is just impressive? Some um, well, okay. Of- so, um, so when we add two Fibonacci numbers together, you get the next Fibonacci number, right? It's like mm-hmm. two plus three is five, three mm-hmm. plus five is eight, five plus eight is 13. What if you add the squares of Fibonacci numbers together? Like one squared plus two squared, one plus four is five, and five is a Fibonacci number. Mm-hmm. If we take two squared plus three squared, right? Four plus nine, that's 13. And 13 is a Fibonacci number. 
If we take three squared plus five squared, right? The consecutive Fibonacci numbers, three and five. Nine plus 25 is 34, and that's a Fibonacci number. <laughs> and that always works. It all goes on forever. Why? I'll tell you my favorite fact. My favorite fact about Fibonacci numbers is um, involves something called greatest common divisors. Now, stay with me on this. If I said, what's the biggest number that divides say 70 and 90 what's the biggest number that goes into 70 and goes into 90 you would say 10 10 goes into 70 10 goes into 90 and nothing else goes into Goodbye. nothing bigger goes into both of them all right now if i ask you what is the biggest number that goes into the 70th fibonacci number and that's some huge huge zillion digit you know uh number in the beyond the billions and a 90 digit number so what's the biggest number that goes into the 70th fibonacci number and the 90th fibonacci number you know what it is you might think it would be 10 because <laughs> 10 goes to the 70 and 90 but it's better than that it's the 10th fibonacci number it's f10 <laughs> So F10 go is the biggest number that goes into F70 and F90. So the greatest common divisor of Fibonacci numbers is the Fibonacci number of the greatest common divisor, which if you think about it too hard, you'll get a headache. But that is um, one of my favorite Fibonacci facts. <laughs> I love that. And uh, it's great. It's like me talking to other English teachers about, did you know the word honest appears 42 times in Othello? And then you get this kind of glazed look from a student. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But Absolutely. it's like, it's beautiful. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. And that there's a structure to it yeah. that, um, you know, again, if, uh, if, you took a, if you took a sonnet by Shakespeare and you, you altered one of the words, it would, it would be less perfect. Yeah. It would be less beautiful. And there's a consistency to it and, a, and an elegance to it that is... Um, I totally that... see where you're coming from. I think there is a mathematics to the, the meter, the iambic pentameter. It is, Absolutely. it is mathematical. But unfortunately, there is seen sometimes a divide between English and maths. It's like a left brain, right brain. And you can't be good at English and good at maths. It's one or the other. Have you... <laughs> well, I know people who are, but I, I, I understand that. I mean, you can, only, you can only invest so much time into so many passions, right? I mean, I don't know anyone who, is, who you know, can do everything. Athletics, music, <laughs> academics, you know, carry on a conversation. Um, the, so you have to choose how you invest your time and, um, um, yeah, but I think again, the more you get exposed to these great ideas, the richer your life will be. Yeah. Um, I whether agree. it be music, art, wine, you know, beer, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, and I, I, I'm not a connoisseur of beer or art or wine, but I, in a way I wish I were. Right. I mean, I would just have a richer life, more things to appreciate. Yeah. And you've presented your ideas in several TED Talks. You can watch these on YouTube. They have garnered millions of views, um, these talks. Um, and, you know, they won some of the math tricks that, we, that you showed earlier on the video. I mean, how did you feel about giving those talks, but particularly the first TED talk? Were you were you nervous about it, or? <laughs> <laughs> I was very lucky. The first with the first TED talk that I didn't, I was too naive to be nervous. I did not realize. I mean, I was in front of a group of about a thousand, fifteen hundred, very important people. And so I was a little more nervous than I normally am because I've given my mathematical magic show literally thousands of times in my life. So um, this was something that I, you know, I was going to be more comfortable. I wasn't going to have to think too much about what words I was going to use. I could just focus on the calculating and trying to be a little funny. Um, uh, and so I didn't know that that it would ultimately be seen by millions tens of millions of people and um 
Uh, so I was just doing my show and I had fun and it got a standing ovation and it was a high, one of the best shows I've ever, uh, audiences I've ever performed for. And, um, uh, and then a few years later, they started putting these talks that were initially recorded only for the people who paid to attend and they just put it out online. And, uh, I, it changed my life in that I used to do about 30 or 40 speaking engagements a year, uh, mostly at schools and colleges. And then after the Ted talks came out, um, I was, I, it, that number doubled. I was doing about 80 events a year and, um, and they were, they not only were they schools and universities, they were corporate gigs and national conferences. And it, um, it, it did change my life in that way. Um, so yeah, congratulations. Uh, and, and I did two talks afterwards, mm -hmm. um, one on the value of statistics versus calculus and the other one on Fibonacci numbers. <laughs> and, um, and in both of those cases, even though they were shorter talks, one was just three minutes. I was very nervous. You know, I mean, I, you couldn't maybe see on camera, but my legs were shaking <laughs> yeah, because I think I knew that this isn't just for the thousand people in the audience. This is for probably millions of people. Yeah. And, um, and so it, it was, uh, I, even though this, the, by the time I did my third talk and I had practiced this talk for, I don't can't tell you how many days, hours, just huge number of hundred times I must have practiced giving this talk. And, um, and yet a few minutes into it, my leg starts wobbling. Like I wanted to <laughs> yell to my body and say, stop that. Come on. But some part of my brain knew this is a, a lot of people are going to see this. So. Yeah. Uh, no, they were, they were great talks and you can, anyway. you can watch those online. Um, yeah. Very nice. Um, do you find it fatiguing to do the maths? Or, you know, after doing a show, are you, are you kind of exhausted afterwards? Or, or more, not? more physically than mentally, no. uh, except for like the, the last problem I do in my show where I'm mentally squaring or multiplying a five digit number. Um, the calculations aren't actually that hard for me. Mm. Um, so it's not so much mentally draining as physically because if I'm going to be entertaining my audience with mathematics, and as you said, there's a good portion of the population uh, for which math is a four-letter word. At least in the UK, <laughs> it's a five-letter word. But where I come from, it's a four-letter word. And people can get very, you know, so I have to try, I have to put a lot of energy into the show um, to be, uh, for pe before people realize that they're being entertained with mathematics. Yeah. So, um so I can be pretty tired after the show. But. Did you say earlier that your dad was, was an actor? Is, is that correct? Yes. So... Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, purely non-professional, but mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, he, he uh, acted and directed lots of shows in our community. My, the one thing my brother, sister, and I have in common is that we were raised on the stage. And, oh. and I think <laughs> that helped all of us be very comfortable being up in front of groups and that led to my being a professor and my sister being a director of marketing and my brother is a teaches theater at, at the high school and uh younger levels so brilliant uh, yeah. fundamental part of our lives <laughs> because it's interesting because i'm sure in america as in anywhere else in the world there are many very good mathematicians many you know renowned maths professors but i think what sets you apart is you bring with the maths that kind of enthusiasm and kind of theatricality the, yep. the performance you know aspect um which makes it as you said memorable and, and fun and, exactly um, exactly i i credit both my family upbringing me up in the theater as well as um my doing magic shows, just traditional entertaining kids at birthday parties, magic shows for my, when I was in high school and college. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I learned a lot about how to engage with an audience yeah. um, through that, so. Fantastic. Are there any mathematicians that you look up to, like in the past, you know, anyone you admire? Oh. 
Um, I'll, I'll mention some names, people like Martin Gardner, who probably did more to popularize mathematics in the 20th century than uh, anyone else. He, he's, he's written dozens of mathematical books. Um, uh, there were math, uh, there's a mathematician named Percy Diaconis, who's still a professor at Stanford University, uh, also a top magician. Um, <laughs> John Conway, who passed away during COVID, uh, uh, was a uh, who was a educated and, a, and later a professor at Cambridge. Um, uh, finished his career at Princeton. Uh, was just a both a mathematical genius and you know just uh, an extraordinary thinker. Um, those are some of the people I uh, I, I looked up to um, for mm, sure. Fantastic. And how do you deal with, um, you know, I've read on the internet people who say, oh, numbers don't exist, or one plus one doesn't equal two, and all these things, are, I, don't, I don't know really, I don't really understand what they're saying, to be frank, but. Well, I, you I, know, I, it's, it, it, numbers, numbers are an abstraction, right? I mean, you will not go in the world, literally run into a one or a two. <laughs> We assign the idea of oneness and twoness hmm. to single objects and pairs of objects, but they don't, in some sense, the numbers are one of the first abstract creations of the human mind. Um, and to go from numbers and eventually to calculus and beyond is quite an achievement for humanity. Hmm. Um, you know, but does uh, six plus seven equal 13? Well, yes and no. It, it's 13, if we're counting six pennies and seven pennies, we get 13 pennies. But if I look at a clock and it's six o'clock now in seven hours, is it 13 o'clock? Well, maybe if you're doing 24 hour time, <laughs> but you might call that one o'clock. So there's a consistent mathematics where six plus seven is one, um, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. in, in binary arithmetic, one plus one might be zero, right? <laughs> if one, in, if one represents the notion of oddness and zero represents the notion of evenness, then odd plus odd is even is saying one plus one is zero and even plus odd is odd says so zero plus one is one. And there's a completely consistent arithmetic that can be built around clock arithmetic or binary arithmetic and crazy irrational other kinds of arithmetic. <laughs> um, now, whether those people who are saying one plus one doesn't equal two are being very subtle and smart, like I'm describing here, or they're just being jerks, I don't know. <laughs> but there is, a, there is a legitimate way of taking, and that's one of the great things about mathematics, is it allows you to look at things from other points of view, mm -hmm. you know, sure. uh, and that's how, that's why it's a, it's a much more creative subject than people, uh, people think about My, most people's experience with mathematics. Maybe all the experience you had in school was, was not presenting mathematics in a creative way. It was a methodical way. It was a disciplined way. It was, this is what you do to add those numbers. This is what you do to factor those polynomials. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, and you never get to see the beautiful creative side to mm -hmm. the subject. And um, in the same way that many people might never appreciate great literature if they're spending all their time learning how to spell, yeah. you know, and then, then, then they're, and they say, yeah, that's what English is. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's learning how to spell. Well, why do we need to spell? We got spell checkers on our computer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we could talk for hours about that. And I mean, teachers now are so driven by assessments and target setting and all these kind of peripheral aspects, I suppose, that, that get in the way of the creative approach, you know, being able to plan fun activities, this kind of Montessori school method or the Steiner school right. model which you may have heard of, which is very like non-assessment, uh, learn when you're ready and so on. The problem is we, we either don't trust our teachers 
or we we haven't set standards high enough where we can trust all of our teachers because if you do trust your teachers if your teachers were themselves star students and when when they were in school then then let them teach the however they want you know at um nobody is telling professors at universities how to teach their courses nobody is telling doctors how to train future doctors because they trust them the methods that they use are going to be le legitimate. The problem that we face in the U.S. is that um, uh, we don't value the teaching profession enough mm -hmm. to, to support our teachers enough, to pay them enough, to attract the best and the brightest to go into the teaching profession. Sure. Um, and if that's if if the if the teachers were themselves, you know, not excited about mathematics or English when they were high school students, how can you expect them to pass enthusiasm on to the next generation? Yeah, so, 100%. I mean, that's a, that's a whole other story. <laughs> that we don't want to get We have the same thing. We have one in five teachers quitting the teaching profession and many schools actually struggling to employ maths teachers. Um, right. Anyway, let's talk about backgammon now. Let's, oh, uh, yeah, let's <laughs> as we're on my channel talking about backgammon. Uh, when did you first play backgammon? What was when? When did you learn it? How long ago was that? Uh, I, I um I was probably in the early seventies. I was I don't know, 10, 12 years old, something like that. And um, uh, I remember my mother had come home from a friend's house and she said that she saw someone who this beautiful backgammon table at their home she said it was so beautiful she said she would she'd even learn how to play the game to have a nice piece of furniture like that and i got very excited i was into chess and i said oh wow great and I, you know i'm always looking for people in my family to play games with so i went off to the library i read whatever books they had on backgammon i learned how to play and I taught my family. We never got the beautiful piece of furniture, but I, I went out and bought a nice little backgammon set. And I think because I learned how to play backgammon from the library books you know, that I read, I knew about strategy well beyond all the other kids that were playing the game. So I was a pretty good backgammon player just from the things that I picked up in those books by people like McGrill and Crawford and all those ancient <laughs> books. Um, the McGrill book, of course, was great. And um, uh, so I considered myself to be a pretty good player. And the fact that it did involve arithmetic, there's actually numbers counting for counting shots and you know, it, it, it fit my brain really nicely. So I got very excited about it and um, uh, went off to college in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There was a there was a backgammon club uh, the, that 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 met just down the block from where I went to college. So I got to play in their tournaments and just one thing led to another. I read more books. I learned more. I played more. Um, <laughs> and uh, and yet. I will say, even though I've been playing this game now for close to 50 years, I'm always finding myself saying, you know, five years ago, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, even if I thought I I've always thought of myself as a good player, but I've also always thought that five years ago, I was a much worse player. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. and for various reasons of, you know, uh, books, software, whatever, um, I just find myself learning. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Yeah, very true. Would you say your love for maths um, was concurrent with your love for backgammon? They kind of dovetailed. Yeah. I, 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 I've always loved games, and I found that the, and the mathematics that I, I gravitated towards was mathematics that could be applied towards games. So combinatorics number theory and game theory and probability and statistics were all things that could be applied to games in a nice way and the, mm. the more the, the the more you understood the mathematics of the game the more you'd win so um and i i will say on the other hand as you know you could play high level backgammon and not do very much mathematics at least not consciously 
Um, but the, the, the strategies and the rules and the reference positions that you learn and master are all built on them on solid mathematics. So, mm. um, so you're, uh, if you're using mathematics, kind of unconsciously, even if you're not fully aware of it. Yeah, you know, for example, you, if you have to leave a direct shot, if you have to leave a shot, you know, even if you're not consciously counting, you know, there are more ways to hit a shot that's six away than there are to hit a shot that's seven away or eight away or mm -hmm. nine away. Right. And as you move that checker closer, five, four, three, two, one, those numbers go down. Right. So even if you don't necessarily know, oh, four shot, four away, that's 15, five away, that's also 15, six away. Oh, that's 17. Mm -hmm. It's good to have those numbers. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Hardwired because <laughs> you have to calculate those each time. Then that's time, inefficient time that you're spending. Right. So um, but you can also just say, oh, I'm going to leave two. I'm going to leave a shot that's three away. Oh, that's that's one away instead of a shot that's three away. And that's just common sense. Yeah. Um, but it's built on mathematics. Yeah, totally. And I guess that's a really nice way um, to introduce students to maths by playing backgammon. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, I, 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 think, I think it's a way of introducing them to life. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I, backgammon has drama. Backgammon has... Um, this, you know, upsides and downsides. And sometimes you do the right thing and you lose anyway. And, and <laughs> yeah. to, to understand that about life and luck and even dealing with misfortunes, it's, it's a way of building character. It's a, um, I, I think if you, I think if you take the gambling aspect out of backgammon and just, you know, take it not as a money game, but just as a, as an interesting, challenging game, it could be, be one of the best uh, life tools, learning tools that students would ever see. Yeah. Um, and and the people who are out there making six figure salaries, um, you know, trading stocks and uh, options and stuff, those are the people that have very quantitative minds that get sharpened through games like backend. Yeah. So um, that's a. It, it, <laughs> there's so much uh, that could be. Um, that, that, that I think people would benefit by learning this game early in life. Um, it just has to be uh, separated from its origins of being a gambler's game. That's right, yeah. Um, okay, let's have a look at what you've got here, um, this PowerPoint. Understand okay, that no, I didn't come here planning to do a whole talk, um, but I do have some slides from a talk I gave a couple years ago and it, the theme was the numbers one through 10. So the idea was I was going to give um, uh, 10 different neat ideas, each based on a number from one through 10. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I have to say, I, I haven't reviewed all these slides right beforehand. So I may skip around because I don't want to go through the whole thing. Yeah. But, I'll, um, but let's have some fun. <laughs> let's, and, um, let's see. If, uh, if I go to here... You see the slides, it says? I see we... the title slide, Understanding Backgammon Formulas. All moment. right. So let's, um, okay, so here's rule one, all right? Bearing off the one point. And this is, this is so sometimes called McGrill's theorem. It says, in a non-contact bear off position with at least one checker on the ace point, it is always correct to use an ace to bear off a checker, right? So if, if, um, if, if, if here's a position, and you roll a two one as, as white, right? You might be tempted to, to play the one from the six point down to the five point. You might go six, four, six, five, but that would be an error. You know, that would be a big error. You, you must use the ace to take the ace off uh, the ace point, always, mm -hmm. okay, no exceptions. Wow. Um, so that's, <laughs> uh, that's rule one, always use ones to take <laughs> off, yeah? Oh, okay. um, while we're on the subject, here's another th time when it's right to be greedy. If you roll doubles and you could take off all four checkers, four checkers with doubles, then you should uh, almost always do so. There are counter examples, but you might never see them in your lifetime of real play. Um, if you roll a non-doubles and you can take off two checkers, 
you should almost always do so. Again, 99.9% .9 of the time, if you roll a five and a three, take off a five, take off a three. You roll a four, two, take off a four, take off a two. Here's, here's an example of a time when that rule would be wrong. Here, white has a four, two to play. You could take the four off and the two off, but then you'd have 13 checkers left. You'd be in a seven roll position with a gap on the two point. A better play to make would be to go four to two and take a checker on the three off because now you have 14 checkers left. You still have a seven roll position, but now you have no gap on the two point. In fact, you've got two checkers on the two point, right? And I think most players would instinctively know to do that anyway. Yeah. But but that's like, these are it. The, the only exceptions are positions that look like these weird things. <laughs> so always, always be greedy when you're bearing off. If you could take two check, if you roll non-doubles and you could take two checkers off, always do so. Doesn't mean that you should always take at least one checker off. Like that, I, I won't, let's not go off on tangents. Okay, rule number two, I call this the two EH formula. And this is a handy formula for computing the number of ways to hit your opponent when you're on the bar. Okay. So, so if I ask you how many, how many shot whites on the bar here. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, how many ways can white hit black? Notice black has a checker here on the 10 point, right? So white has four numbers that enter one, two, four, and five. That's four entering numbers. And white can hit with two numbers, ones and threes, right? So white has two hitting numbers. So how many shots does white have against black here? And the answer is, uh, is almost exactly 2EH, where E is the number of entering numbers and H is the number of hitting numbers, right? So in that last example, white has four entering numbers, ones, twos, fours, and fives, and has two hitting numbers, ones and threes. And so if I take two times E times H, two times four times two, we get 16, which happens to be exactly right, All right? Um, and I call this a handy formula because you could do it on your hands. <laughs> on one hand, you count the entering numbers. On the other hand, you count the hitting numbers. You multiply your hands together and multiply that by two, and that's, that's very, very close to the exact number of hits. Sometimes it's spot on. There are other, I'm not going to go into the caveats and why this works. I mean, that's all for the maths. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip all these slides so I can show you some more fun stuff. But if you want to see the details, see the summer 2019 issue of primetime magazine that is the magazine of the u.s backgammon federation i have a whole article on uh shots from the bar using the 2eh formula so if you want more more examples that's where you should go to see and you do write a regular column for that don't you as well yes i do mm. so every for the last uh since 2019 I've, I've written a column in every issue, so I've had oh, 19, 20, 20, 20. I've written about 15 articles, um, and uh, eventually I'll put them all together in the form of a book, but you don't want to have to wait years to, <laughs> to read that, you know, read the stuff now. Um, so uh, anyway, that was one of my earlier articles. Um, so, okay, rule three, three checkers on the bar. Suppose you have three checkers closed out on the bar. How gammonish is it? How backgammonish is it? Right? So if, if looking at white's position here, white is closed out, uh, how often does white lose a gammon? Any ideas? How and uh, how often does white lose a backgammon? All right? So um, uh, white loses a gammon about 77% of the time and loses a backgammon about 5% of the time from this, uh, from this position. Um, in fact, the backgammons, on the other hand, with four checkers on the bar, it's now up, now you get backgammon 20%. With five checkers on the bar, you get backgammon 40%. So that's good numbers to know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but, but interestingly, when you're closed out on the bar, the more checkers you have on the bar, it actually slightly increases your winning chances because you're more likely to hit a late <laughs> shot. So with five checkers on the bar, you can actually win, assuming your, your, your board isn't crunched, 
about 4% of the time. So that's keep that in mind. Um, here are some fun little formulas like uh, gammon formulas. How many gammons if you have three checkers on the bar, right? And the answer is 78 plus P, where P uh, is your outside pips. So I'll give you an um, So for example, if you had 10 check, if you had three checkers on the bar, let's say, and, and a checker on the midpoint. That checker on the midpoint has to go seven pips to come in, right? Your chance of being gammoned would be 78 plus seven, 85 percent. And this, these formulas are pretty good. They're within a couple percent of um, of, of the truth. Um, how many gammons with um, two on the bar uh, and p outside pips? I use this formula a lot. It's 40 plus two p. If as long as as long as that 40 plus 2p is under 80%, you can pretty much take that number to the bank. 40 plus 2p is your um, uh, uh, chance of getting uh, gammon. And if once you get over 80%, now each extra pip penalizes you one pip. So 60 plus p if p is bigger than 20. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, in this position, right, white's closed out and white had to bear in is gonna need what? Seven plus four, 11 pips to come in in addition to the two checkers that are on the bar. So uh, how often do you get gammoned? 40 plus two P, 40 plus 22 is 62%. XG thinks it's around 65%, right? But gives you a pretty good ballpark. Yeah. Um, uh, similarly with one checker on the bar, um, the first, the first 14 checkers are worth about one and a half percent. And after that, the, the checkers are worth about 3%. And then after that, they're worth about 2%. Then after that, they're worth about 1%. All you have to remember are these three numbers with two checkers on the midpoint. Uh, that's 14 pips. You'll get gammoned about 20% of the time with 24 pips. Uh, you which is like two checkers on the midpoint and, uh, Oh, I don't know, 10 other pips. You'll, uh, you'll have, um, uh, you'll get gammon 50% of the time. Right. And with 40 pips, you'll get gammon 80% of the time. Um, where I use this in my practical play is as long as I'm between 20 and 80% of, of winning a gammon, I will take small risks, reasonable risks to go for the gammon. Whereas if the number's under 20%, or over 80%, it's not worth taking those risks, right? I'll play super safe if they're under 20%. I'll play super safe if I'm over 80% to win the gamut. Um, let's see, rule of four, what does that say? Um, uh, one, one way, one maybe the, the popular rule of four says, suppose white has closed out black and black has taken off X checkers um, when should white redouble? And the rule of four says white should redouble after bearing off X minus four checkers. Prior to that, it's no double. After that, it's a pass. Let's see, here's a picture, right? So um, black has taken off six checkers, right? The rule of four says, okay, six minus four is two. Once white has taken off two checkers, it should be a double and a take. Prior to that, it's not a double. After that, it's not a take. So it's a very reliable rule. Six minus four is two. So here we have a, uh, a clear double and a clear take, mm -hmm. right? Um, on the other hand, with uh, seven checkers off, seven minus four is three. White only has two checkers off, so white doesn't have enough checkers. It's not a double, right? And uh, with five checkers off, five minus four is one, you've lost your market, right? Because you, you have two checkers off instead of one. So it's a pass. So this rule of four is, is great. I use it when the, when the board is closed. I use it when, um, even when I'm down to it with a five point board, you can use this rule, right? Um, uh, once you start getting more crunched, the numbers change a little bit, but with a six point board and a five point board, rule of four rocks. Um, let's see, yeah, I'll skip this here. Um, here's a, here's a, uh, uh, oh, well, I, I will say it's a corollary rule of five 
is when um, uh, black has taken five checkers off, then um, black's going to have, you know, black doesn't have to, black can be closed out and still have a take before white has taken off any checkers, mm -hmm. right? So once you have five checkers off, you have a take, even if your checker gets hit is largely what it's saying. As long as it's just one checker that's hit. Um, rule six, the 60% rule. In a long race with more than 60 pips, if both players have the same pip count, the player on roll has about a 60% chance to win the race. Okay. So when the, when the race is, when the pip count is tied, again, assuming we're more than 60 pips, then your chance of winning is about 60%. Um, by the way, feel free Dan, to ask me questions, interrupt me as we go along, but, um, uh, that's, that's a nice little rule. Um, and each pip is worth about 2%. Okay. So if you're leading by P pips and the player on roll wins about 60 plus two P percent of the time, at least, at least up through five pips. Once you get past the 70% mark, those numbers start decreasing. Mm -hmm. Um, instead of two, it goes down to one, what goes down to about one and a half. And, um, anyway, so uh, that's the 60% rule, by the way, if you're trailing by four, if you're on roll and you're trailing by four, you win 50% of the time, right? Because ha being on roll is worth about four pips. Oh, Hey, I even had that in the slide trailing by four <laughs> pips. Uh, the race is even. Okay. Um, let's see. Ah, rule seven, Walter Trice's seven N plus one formula. This one is maybe more advanced because um, you want to use it gets applied with EPC and that's a whole lecture in itself. Mm -hmm. It's what I'm crazy about. I love thinking about EPC. But let me just give you this beautiful formula. It's my favorite formula in mathematical backgammon. It says in a non-contact position, the EPC, the effective pip count, is the average number of pips needed to bear off that position. All right, that's equal to the pip count plus the average number of wasted pips. And when you use XG, you may notice that it, it, when you analyze uh, your position, it will mention not only your pip count, but this thing called the EPC. So that's what it's telling you. It's like here, white's position here, even though white has 15 pips, it's going to take white on average 29.9 pips to bear off that position. And black's position here, even though it has... Uh, 27 pips is going to take on average 35.1 pips to bear off that position, right? Mm -hmm. And EPC is the thing you use, especially when you want to compare very rollish positions like whites to very pippish positions like blacks. And, um, you know, when you want to compare apples with oranges, you turn them both into a cantaloupe and that cantaloupe <laughs> is EPC, all right? Now, I'm not going to, again, I give you a whole several hour lecture on EPC. Um, and in fact, if anyone's going to Cyprus, I will, I am giving a one hour lecture on EPC. If you come to the Cyprus tournament this, uh, this November, but, um, uh, and I get, and I gave a little bit of this at the UK open, sure. uh, earlier this year. So, um, anyway, so here's Trice's seven N plus one formula. It says if white has N pairs of checkers on the ACE point, and white's EPC is almost exactly 7N plus 1. So if you have seven or eight checkers on the ace point, that's four pairs of checkers, all right? Then the EPC would be 7 times 4 plus 1, which is 29, right? Um, and here, white's position is eight checkers. If they were all on the ace point, the EPC would be 29.0. But because they're a little shifted from the ace point, not all your double double ones doesn't play as well. Double twos doesn't play as well as if they were all on the ace point. You know, it costs you a little bit more. Uh, so the EPC here is twenty nine is almost thirty. Okay, um, rule number eight. I like this one. You'll like this one. It's I I call it wait until eight. Here's the situation: you have one checker back, and all the rest of your checkers are home or nearly so. Do you stay back and wait for a shot or do you run to avoid <laughs> losing a gammon, right? Like here's a, here's a typical position, right? You're white and you roll a six, two. Do you say, do you stick around or do you, do you run away? Right? 
So black has nine checkers remaining. So my mnemonic here is nine is fine, but wait until eight. That is uh, with nine checkers, you should stay, um, you know, and, and wait for the shot. With eight checkers, you should probably go, all right? So, um, uh, and here it is, white can stay. It, it turns out here, it's, it's a borderline decision. You could stay or you could go, but nine is fine. But wait until eight. Once you're once it's eight, uh, there's too much of a chance that they're going to get off in three rolls, mm -hmm. and you you want to be you want to use you don't want to be wasting pips. You want to get out of there so you don't get gamma. Whereas with um, with nine checkers, it's much more unlikely that they're off in three rolls. So uh, that's why nine is fine. But eight, you know, it's time to go. <laughs> I like it. Right. Enough. Anyway, so here's. I, this might be a good place to stop. These are the um, these are the formulas that I've uh, I've covered one through eight. I got more more rules. I've got twenty rules ultimately out there, <laughs> but uh, but I think that would be over overkill. Brilliant. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back and um, um, there's a taste of some of the mathematics and backgammon that I I like to do. I think that's uh, it, it's beautiful and impressive. And I think obviously there's a lot of uh, work that's gone into kind of boiling that down and distilling it to a kind of simplistic, well, not simplistic, but an easy to remember kind of I, thing. Yeah. It's important to me that the results that, that I come up with are not just accurate, but math that you can do over the board. That's the, my, my, the title of my column is called Math Overboard because... I'd like to think that it's math you can do over the board, although I think it, most people just think I'm just going way overboard. <laughs> with but uh, anyway, like whichever that. way you want to think of it. Um, I like the yeah. pun. We must speak a little bit more about backgammon. So when you play a match, whether it's, it's live or online, how much time do you spend kind of analyzing? Do you do much of that after the match? Do you kind of go through the, the errors and the blunders you've made? And, and do some number crunching or how, how does that how does that look for you the post game yeah the the, the aftermath right <laughs> the um, aftermath. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. um you know uh i should spend more time on it than i do obviously i go through the match and i look at every move i look at my errors and especially look at my blunders um and it would probably be worthwhile after every match I play to find the worst blunder and really try and understand what went wrong there, right? I mean, we're, every match we play, we're going to have blunders. Look at the worst blunder and say, what am I missing here, right? And maybe just swim inside of positions like that kind of position. You know, I, I, I found myself having a lot of trouble with positions where I would be I would be almost closed out. You know, I would be one checker on the bar against a five point board. Right. So I, I let's say it's the six points open. Right. And um, and my opponent is coming around. Now, I might be ahead in the race, but I'm stuck on this on the bar against a five point board. What do you, you know, what are, and I find myself being playing both sides of that cube very wrongly. Like I wouldn't double until it was way too late. Like I should have doubled many moves ago or, or I might get doubled and, um, and I'm on the bar and I would take, even though it was a big pass, you know, and I just didn't understand that. So pause, look at, you know, Look at the positions. What's what's going on? How important is the other players? Is my board? You know, is it a closed board? Is it a five point board? Is it a four point board? You know, what? How how important <laughs> is that? How important are builders? You know, um, uh, to you know, builders trained on that open six point. What if it's not an open six point? What if it's an open five point, four point, three point, two point, ace point? Right. You know. Um, swim in those kinds of positions and you'll learn more in that hour of swimming than you will just going, oh, darn it, I should have taken, you know, and <laughs> next move, next blunder, right? Mm -hmm. 
So uh, I, I hope I follow this advice more myself. <laughs> um, I sometimes do, but too often it's like, mm, oh man, okay, I, yeah, I should have done that. Next game, you know. Yeah, how much when you play, when you get a cube, um, let's say a tournament match, how much are you are you going on your gut and just a, a knowledge of reference positions? And how much are you like really like crunching the numbers in that position to find the answer? Oh, uh, gosh, I certainly will crunch some numbers a few times in the match. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm always keeping track of the pip count. Mm -hmm. I mean, not always, but when it's important to to know and it, about half the time it is important to know uh, <laughs> what your pip count is. Um, uh, so I'm doing some some light number crunching. I might count be counting shots yeah. here and there. Um, uh, for complicated racing positions, I go through a method. I go through a process. Uh, I'll do some real crunching. I mean, sometimes it's an easy one. Oh, 10% plus two. Great. You know, um, I've, I've got 80 and you've got 92. That's a borderline. Uh, yeah, well, that's a pass. You know, 10% uh, of 80 plus two is 90. Uh, that's your point of last take. You know, yeah. there's a little bit of, you know, easy plan. number crunching. But sometimes it's uh, it's a little more complicated. Like, oh, man, you know, uh, which shot, how many shots do I leave? And am I, is, should I leave more shots with and have one blot out there or two shots and have, you know, or fewer shots and have two checkers out there? Right. Um, right. you just have to weigh it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you something that I do that isn't number crunching, but sometimes is helpful. I mean, all right. So there's some qualitative things you can do, like looking at things like your position, your race, your threats, your gamuts, you know, those are non-mathematical, you know, qualitative results to say, well, I have a stronger position. I'm ahead in the race. I've got threats. Yeah. You know, I'm ahead yeah. in all these qualitative aspects. So it's probably a double and probably a pass. Mm -hmm. Right. And that doesn't require any number crunching. Um, uh, where was I going with this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, so, but, but, but there are times when I, I, I do have to, um, do some number crunching, or I'll do this. I'll be looking at my position before deciding on the double, and I'll very quickly look at all 21 rolls. I mean, I'll just sort of say in my head, double six, double five, double four, double three, double two, double one, and I'll just sort of get my reaction. What would happen if that were my next roll? Like a split second gut reaction. Mm -hmm. Six five, six four, six three, six two, six one, five four, five three, five three, five. You know, go all 21 rolls, and I'll say, oh wow, there are a lot of really good rolls in there. I'm going to double, right? Mm -hmm. Or I might say, you know, there really weren't that many market wizards other than those original doubles that I was looking at. So probably not, mm -hmm. you know? So those are, that's crunching of a different sort that I'll do throughout my match. How do you respond though to, let's say, an intermediate um, player of a game? They get to the point where they they might be looking further into match equity and take points and just being in a little bit frightened, you know, of it. Right? How, how can I remember this? These calculations over the board, it, it, it's scary. You, 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 the, the, it, first of all, <laughs> read my article in the mag, Backgammon magazine. I've got a whole article on take points. I've got a whole article on four cubes and beyond. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, it's not, you're not really doing that much number crunching. Okay. You, it's just a matter of relative to what would be a money take or a money decision or at zero zero when we're you know, at the beginning of a seven or 11 point match. Um, um, so for example, here's, here, here's a, here, here's a nice formula for, um, uh, for four cubes, right? If um, now, if the four cube puts the match on the line, like if I'm three away and I, and I send you a four cube, I, I know you're going to, if you take it, you're sending it right back. Mm -hmm. Right. And we can figure out, you know, say, so if it's three away and you've got seven away and I send you a four cube, I know you're going to say, well, if I pass this, it's one away, seven away. And that's like nine or 10%. So I know. And then, so we're putting the match on the line. Yeah. You only need to be nine or 10% 
to take that cue. But let's do something more normal. Say the score is 2-0 in an 11-point match, okay? And I send you a 4 cube. Now, this is not, this is like a race or a holding game. There's no gammons involved. And I'm ahead 2-0. What's your take point, all right? And the answer is um, you're trailing by 2. So it's 22 minus 2 times the difference. The difference is 2. So 22 minus 4 is 18%. If I were winning 3-0, 22 minus 2 times the difference. The difference is 3. Mm. 22 minus 6 is 16%. Okay? And that's what you need to... You can take that cue with a 16% chance. Um, you know, that's... You know, that gives you a few extra pips in the race yeah. um, to take. Right? Uh, if you hit 1 out of 6 times... Yeah. That's uh, and you win and you win those times, then you could take. Um, so um, the answer is there. There used to be some very complicated ways for figuring out take points and stuff, and it would just be exhausting and largely wrong. <laughs> so um, uh, there are some very simple tools you can use. Uh, to estimate take points. Let me use this moment to, to advertise a book that just came out this month by Nick Blazier. Yes. Which is, so you should have Nick on your show. I have had him on already. Yeah. Yes. Have him on again because <laughs> he's got a book to sell and it's on match score considerations. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm halfway into this book. And as he stresses, it's really more of a qualitative approach than a quantitative approach at, uh, at most match scores. It isn't so much a, um, oh, if I, here's my doubling window and here's how much I lose and here's how much I gain and that's the dead cube take point and I have to yeah. subtract this. Oh, forget it. You know, especially <laughs> with a clock, you don't want to do it. I don't want to do it even without a clock. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, the math weaves in and out of the game. Yeah. And and you don't have to do, be able to do everything to do a lot and yeah. to, to improve your game. So um, I, I think there's a great skill in taking something complicated and rendering it down into something kind of digestible and easy to understand. And I think what makes you so good is, you know, you're taking these very complicated mathematical ideas and, and finding a way to make them palatable for an audience and ultimately easier for me i mean the, the more i'm thinking hard about how do i make this easy to understand uh for others to use that helps my game as well yeah so, um uh it's yeah i i you know for me it's always been fun the fun part is also coming up with mnemonics and rules <laughs> of thumb and you know, how do you remember this? I mean, I just gave you a nice little rule, yeah. but you got to remember it, right? Well, read the article, read it twice. Yeah, I, I uh, agree. Read, read the summary. <laughs> um, oh, by the way, what about, what, what if it was the, 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 let's say you were trailing three nothing, and now it's the person who has zero who sends the, cube, the four cube, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what, what you, to, if you're the leader, it's you need more than 22 percent to take and instead of it being adding two times that difference it's one and a half times that difference right. so if the difference is three that's four and a half so you could take uh if, if you have 26 and a half percent or better again that might buy you a couple pips in the race it might you know um or more more more, or you might need, um, you know, it costs you a couple of pips in the race, I should say, yeah. or you need a couple extra shots, um, <laughs> you know, within the contact position. Yeah, uh, it's, it's really interesting. I think that's what makes backgammon boot camp so good because Walter Trice has things like the Formula 62. Yep, uh, which by the way, my that is my favorite backgammon book so far, <laughs> is backgammon book boot camp. Well, I really look forward to your book, which is, you said, it's going to be a collection of some of the articles you write for Primetime magazine. Yeah, and maybe, I hope it'll be more cohesive than just, you know, stapling together 20 articles. Yeah. I want it to be, ideally, uh, 
a self-contained book in itself. And um, uh, my goal is to publish it not um, uh, it, in a in a mass market, so that I'm not just it, it'll be both a book for people who are backgammon players who want to use mathematics to improve their game, but also I want it to go to people who enjoy mathematics yeah. to see how backgammon is just a wonderful ultimate math game that they may want to um, spend more time with. Yeah. So my my goal my my goal with the book is not just to improve people's games, but to um, increase the popularity of backgammon. Yeah, and I think you will succeed when you are already succeeding in that endeavor. And it will be, it will be a fabulous book. I hope it comes out sooner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll be realistic and say about five years. Yeah. But, um, I mean, uh, so. but it'll happen. I give you my word. You, you have to just tell me about this baker's dozen rule on, on here. I'm, I'm intrigued. Rule number 13. No. Like what, I don't what? know. Actually, uh, <laughs> I have to look about that one. Um, what is that? Uh, I, I, you know what? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a rule of 13. I think I was, I think I was struggling to come up with a rule of 13. Okay. And, um, maybe I've got one now, but, um, uh, the, no, it just nothing's coming to me. I to use. Oh, well, I'll tell you what my dozen rule is. Okay, yeah. So here, here's my dozen rule. This is, in other words, I didn't have a good number for thirteen, but I gave you another rule with twelve, and it goes like this. And thirteen is actually not so bad. This is a, you you have a choice of um, making a safe play, or a risky play. All mm -hmm. right. And the safe play is completely safe, but it's a little ugly. Mm -hmm. The risky play is not ugly at all, um, but it leaves about a dozen shots. A baker's dozen, 13, 14. Right. You know, and my dozen rule says if it's worth leaving about a dozen shots um, to make the purer play the prettier play okay mm -hmm. so um so that's sort of a that's yeah. a almost a qualitative mm -hmm. judgment but if you have a choice between and and i would say beginning players really need this rule because they they often play ultra safe yeah like oh i can't leave a shot you know i'll play 13 to 6 and i'm not going to leave any shots that way but I now have a seventh checker stacked on my six point, right? Mm -hmm. And instead you could play 13, 10, 24, 20, and you're leaving a dozen shots or so, but it's a much more fluid position. Yeah. Uh, then make the pure play. So that's the baker's dozen rule. <laughs> Fantastic. Another 13 I like is that it's easier to divide into 1300 than it is 1296. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good mental math tip. Mm. Right? If you want to divide by 1296, don't ever <laughs> divide by 1300. For that matter, you don't have to divide by 8.2. Just divide by 8. Mm. And you're within 2% of, uh, <laughs> of the quotient. But yeah. some people say, no, it has to be 8.2. Nope. 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 Divide by 8. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, there. Um, I must just say before we finish as well, congratulations on being inducted into the Hall of Fame for USBG oh, Hall of Fame. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I was surprised, honored, humbled. Um, I, there's so much more I want to do with this game, but uh, I did not turn it down. So fantastic. thank you. Um, anything else you want to say, Art, before we, we wrap it up? Um, well, again, I do want to encourage people to... Um, uh, uh, I mean, I, 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 the articles I've written, I, I want people to see them. Um, and I think the, you get a lot of value in joining the US BGF, the US Backgammon Federation. You get access to all of their magazines. There's a treasure trove of them. They go, mm -hmm. go back 10 years. And I've had, and not to say that my column is the only thing worth reading. It's not. There are wonderful columns in there about on rulings and on, um, uh, expert analysis of matches. Marty Storer, one of the best players in the U.S., always carefully analyzes a, 
uh, a few games out of a, a top match, and you always learn from those. Um, you know, at the for the less than the cost of a backgammon lesson, yeah. you can get um, uh, almost a year's worth four issues um, of the of the magazine. So. Um, uh, so let me encourage that. I'm a proud member of the UK BGF, and I hope to um, uh, see more UK BGF members join our group as well. Yes, um, and, and even you know for UK players to go and play in American tournaments and and you know meet you guys because I think uh, it's great having you on and people getting to know who you are you know personally. Uh, so. Yeah. I had a wonderful, wonderful time at the uh, at the UK Open. I, I, I met people who I'd only known online before. Uh, I made lots of new friends, Dan and yourself included, and I'm just uh, uh, can't wait to come back again and and re meet old friends <laughs> and uh, make some new friends. So uh, I think you've got a great group out there, uh, a great great group of players. Uh, cast of characters and uh, <laughs> that's a great community yeah uh, i i'm i'm on my sabbatical this year traveling the world i'm right now in an apartment in morocco wow um <laughs> yeah and then, uh, next week i'll be in greece and then malta and cyprus playing in the back end tournaments i'll be in israel for a few months Amazing. and then probably no more tournaments until japan in may and uh, mm -hmm. but I'm on my academic sabbatical for the whole year. My wife and I are having a wonderful time uh, <laughs> traveling the world. I'm writing papers, doing my own research. And, Fantastic. And, <laughs> uh, me, and I'm going to say meeting uh, backgammon players have been just a very a welcoming community sure. wherever I've gone uh, in the UK, in Denmark, in Norway. Um, I've been blessed to have crossed paths with a lot of great players. Yeah, very much. And I would, I would say the same about you. You were very generous in offering your time to show pet players of the UK Open, um, pip counting or whatever it might be to develop uh, those skills over the board. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, if I see you, anyone who's watching this, if you see me at a tournament, you know, feel free to corner me and I'll talk your ear <laughs> off. Uh, hopefully we'll both have a good time with it. Um, Thank you so much, Art. You know, really, it's been a, a fantastic pleasure to have you on my channel, to, 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 to learn about you as a person, to see your maths, to, to get these tips um, to improve backgammon. Um, so much, so much good stuff, so much good content. And I love your enthusiasm for maths. And, you know, as a teacher, it, it's very special to see it in other people, you know, because yeah. I know how much it means not just as a teacher, but also for your students. It has a, it, it's powerful. It has a powerful effect, you know, on students. Yep. And I, I um, um, yeah, I'm going to link all the things um, in the video, your TED Talks, your, your maths books, um, a link to the USBGF, um, and people can contact you on Facebook, I guess, if I, they want to ask you something about what we've covered um there's a there's a talk i gave at the um san jose tournament uh a few years ago and it's called something like counting methods magical counting methods that's gotten a lot of views and if you google my name with backgammon you'll find this video it's a it's a one hour video and uh it, it some of what i talked about here like the 2eh method is covered but there's a lot of stuff in there that i that, about pip counting and um other fun stuff so i recommend that. wonderful i mean it's fair to say that when your book does come out it's going to be literally a game changer <laughs> so it's uh... well i hope it'll be fun that's yeah. uh, like as i said it's always been my goal to make to present things in a way that um makes people smile and uh and and hopefully it will change the way people think about the game or at least parts of the game you know yeah. that those parts of the game where math can be applied wonderful well your fun is contagious art and hopefully the audience has picked up on on that good energy also and um oh, uh, like and subscribe to my channel if you enjoy uh, my guests well, yeah. and their content well, yeah. um and Many, many thanks, Art. I wish you all the best on your sabbatical and your future endeavors. 
and hopefully see you again in the tournament. I'm sure we will. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Many thanks. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you later.